Because God's word is our spiritual nourishment. And I don't believe anyone in here only eats on Sunday and Wednesdays. Isn't that right? It is our spiritual nourishment. It is our offensive and defensive weapons in this spiritual battle that we are in. It is our encouragement when we feel weak, weary, and worried. It is our hope when the situation seems hopeless. So God's word is too important to not feast upon it every day. It means too much to us to neglect it. Isn't that right? And like MasterCard commercial says, don't leave home without it. And I go so far as to say, don't be home without it. Because the devil can get at you at home too. Isn't that right? In fact, he does some of his best work in the homes. Now, we have been studying how to dress for battle under the theme of keeping it real. And what's real, brothers and sisters, is the fact that we are in a battle. That's real. Isn't that right? We are in a battle. The devil, our enemy, is seeking to control our minds, to destroy our bodies, and to destroy or divert our eternal destiny. That's what he's after. And he's successful in a lot of that. The devil has control over a lot of people's minds. He has destroyed many people's bodies. And he has redirected a lot of people's eternal destiny. Isn't that right? Example, on August 16th, 2010, 29-year-old mother of three by the name of Shaquan Dooley got into an argument with her sister and in the heat of anger she snatched her two young sons uh, Javon and Devon Dooley ages 18 months and two years old checked into a hotel smothered her two babies to death and then put their bodies in the car and drove their car into uh, a body of water. Why did she do that? Why would someone do something like that? Why would someone murder their own babies? You don't know. But what I do know is the devil took control of her mind. And because she couldn't deal with whatever situation she was dealing with, he stepped in and he caused her to do this terrible, terrible act, right? Yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, 19-year-old student at the University of Texas walked into the library. Well, he shot up the building, then walked into the library, took his own life. And I read on the, you know, internet today, everyone who knew this young man couldn't understand why he would do something like that. They said he was brilliant. They said he was very smart. He was a very good person. He would never harm anyone. But yet he took his own life. The devil, brothers and sisters, is strong. And his objective is to control the minds of people and to cause them to do these kinds of things. And the only way we can contend with someone like that is in the power and the might of the Lord. Because we are no match for a devil and his army in and of ourselves. Isn't that right? And so it is imperative that we get into this word. And it is imperative that we understand the nature of the battle that we or in. And so, being in battle, to be in a battle, is something that you must prepare for. Anyone disagree with that? Before anyone go into battle, you must prepare yourself. I'll give you an example. 
in the sporting world, if you are a boxer or a football player or a basketball player or volleyball, or whatever your sport is, you do not just show up on the day of the game and get into the game and play and expect to be victorious. Isn't that right? We're in the political season now, election season now, and all of the politicians, you know, getting ready to engage in debate. You don't just walk into a debate without having done some homework, done some studying, done some preparation for the debate. Isn't that right? And so it is in battle. You do not go into battle unprepared. And if you go into battle, any contest, unprepared, you can prepare yourself to be defeated because defeated is exactly what's going to happen to you. Now, we've been talking about, and let's turn to that, let's refresh our memories. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, let's look at what Paul says our armor should be in preparation for the battle that we are engaged in. Ephesians chapter 6, Verse 10, beginning, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And we talked in our last class about the first few of these weapons. First of all, Paul says that we ought to be strong where? In the Lord. And in the power of his might. Isn't that right? He says to put on the whole armor of God. Reason, purpose that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. If you do not have on the whole armor of God, you cannot stand against the methods, against the tricks, against the deceptions of the devil. No match for him. Isn't that right? And you remember I said that that expression in the original language, put on the whole armor of God, implies that we put the armor on and we keep it on. It's not something you take off and put on like, you know, your work uniform or a military uniform. He says to put this on and you keep it on. Why? Because to take it off is to be exposed. To take it off is to be vulnerable. To take it off is to be open to attack to the devil. And he does not take a day off. There is never a time when his guards are down, so our guard needs to be up also. But we said that that first thing, that first piece of armor was the girdle of truth. And I described to you how the Roman soldier had a belt, and that, that girdle is talking about a belt. It was a belt that he held his stuff together with. They had long robes, and the, the belt, the girdle would hold all that stuff together. It would also hold the weapon, hold the sword. So the belt holds it all together, and the belt that holds it all together for us is truth. This is what Paul says. Number one, truth of the knowledge of God's word. God's word is truth. Isn't that right? And if you do not have a knowledge of God's word, you're in trouble. Now, I'm going to say knowledge of truth versus emotions and versus popular opinion. Because we live in a world 
where a lot of people gauge what they do based on how they feel about it. Isn't that right? A lot of people, their lives are directed by their emotions or the opinions of others. And it just kills me even nowadays. I, I like to watch these court shows on TV, you know, divorce court and Judge Alex and all that, Judge Judy. And they've gotten to the point now where even in the middle of a court, you know, a, a case, before the commercial comes on, the judge will say, well, you know, uh, so-and-so is doing this. What do you think? What does it matter what we think? You know, our society is geared towards opinion polls. And that's why it's so messed up right now, because everybody's got an opinion about everything that's going on, and your opinion don't mean any more than my opinion, and none of it means anything if it's contrary to the word of God. Isn't that right? But God's word is absolute truth, and it is the standard by which we should gauge everything that we do. But not only must we have a knowledge of God's word, as truth, but we must also have an attitude of truthfulness. And I spoke about that in our last class. Truthfulness, here's the key, at all cost. It doesn't matter what it costs you, be truthful. And if I took a poll right now and asked how, asked how many of you have ever lied because you were in a tight, or because it wasn't convenient, or because doing so would get you in trouble, probably everybody in here would raise your hands. And if you didn't, you still got a problem with it. All right? But we should have an attitude of truthfulness. Now, even in the Bible, people did that. You remember Abraham? Abraham lied about Sarah being his wife. Why? Because he feared for his life. If he answered that, he thought they were going to kill him to take his wife. Isn't that right? What about Peter? Turn to, let's read this. We have to read this. Turn to uh, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26. Let me show you something about Peter. Matthew 26, verses 30, beginning 30 through 35. 26 verses 30 through 35 when they had sung a hymn they went out to the Mount of Olives then Jesus told them this very night you will all fall away on account of me mm -hmm. for it is written I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered but after I have risen I will go ahead of you into Galilee Peter replied even if all fall away on account of you, I will, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Okay. Y'all see where Peter's head is right now? Peter's like, I'm with you, Lord. I got your back. No matter what, whatever goes down, I'm with you and I got your back. Drop down to verse 69. And let's see how Peter does. Now Peter was sitting on, out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. Hmm. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath, I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is the same Peter who said, Lord, I'm with you. No matter what happens, even if I have to die, I'm with you. 
not long, not, you know, further down the line, that same night, Peter denied the Lord. Brothers and sisters, many times we do that. Many times we are put in a situation where we deny, not maybe as overtly as Peter did, but we will do something or not do something that in essence is denying the Lord. A couple of weeks ago, or a few days ago, I saw on Oprah, you remember that the guy who went into the Discovery Building and he took hostages and he was mad at the world, he was mad at the system. He was mad about people, you know, the way the world was working. And there were two employees that he took hostage. And one of the employees, his job was, you know, one thing. But when this, this man asked him, what did you do? He lied and said he did something else. Because had he told the man what he really did, the man probably would have shot him. He was afraid that the man would kill him. That's exactly what I'm talking about. He feared for his life, so he lied about what he did. How many times and in what ways have we denied the Lord or in what way has our Christian walk been affected, you know, by being faced with a situation where be honest or be unpopular, be honest or be in trouble, be honest or die. How does our untruthfulness affect our walk as Christians? How does the devil, how does the enemy use that against us? That's the question on the floor. And get free, get get a free commercial, counter. Greg. Free shout out. <laughs> <laughs> I get to the counter to pay uh, for my meal mm -hmm. and Brother Joseph is there and I hand him a 20 and he gives me change for 40. Mm -hmm. And I don't tell him about it. Mm -hmm. The commandment is, thy shall not steal and to be thy brother's keeper. So in both of those instances, I failed my Christian walk because of my dishonesty. Mm -hmm. Some would say, oh, take that, that was a blessing. Mm -hmm. It didn't bless Brother Joseph's family. <laughs> and in the end, it won't bless me because I have stolen from my brother. Absolutely, amen. So it affects your walk how? The dishonesty. How the, does that dishonesty affect your walk, your position as a Christian, your influence as a Christian? I stumble and my character could be questioned mm -hmm. and I can't get that back. Okay. Satan can use that. You remember one of his names, uh, adversary? And one of his names means accuser of the brethren. Satan can use that to say, see God, you got this follower over here, Eula Miles. She claims to be a Christian, but she's over here stealing from her brother. We give him ammunition to use against us. And it also damages our influence as Christians because we are salt and we are light. And the purpose of salt is to make an impact, to be an influence, to, you know, have some uh, effect on how things turn out. And if we are to be like everybody else, then what impact are we making? What influence do we have? Isn't that right? Who else? Go ahead, bro. Uh, just uh, make a comment on that same place where we are. There is all throughout the Bible, the Bible there where there is some unintentional sin. Mm -hmm. Like what Peter actually believed what he said. Mm -hmm. 
that he's going to stick with him and he's going to die. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why I don't like to say I'd never do such and such a thing now because when put in that position now, I don't know what I might do. I hope I do the right thing now. Mm -hmm. I hope I've been and thought about it and prayed on it. There's uh, Rahab. She lied for God's people to protect them now. Hmm. That wasn't a... She deliberately lied to save God's people there, but she, in a sense, that she did a good thing now for the right reasons there. So my motivations was in the right place there. But God do know my heart, and then I hope and pray that, Lord, please forgive me. That's why he said pray all the time for your brothers and sisters there mm -hmm. because we sin sometimes not even knowing that we're sin now. Mm -hmm. Just want to throw that out. But that's why, as I said in the outset, God's word is the standard. True. Because we can sincerely believe what we're doing is the right thing. Yeah. And it could be wrong as two left shoes because we're judging it based on a faulty standard. See, only God's standard is sure. Only God's standard is true. Our emotions are not the criteria. You know, popular opinion is not the criteria. You know, well, I really believe that it was the right thing to do. That's not the standard. What the standard is, is what God's word says about it. That's why it's imperative that we get into God's word and find out what he says. And even when we know what it says, we're not going to keep it perfectly because we are flawed. But just like Peter, when you fall down, you get up. Get up. You don't stay down like Judas did. That's what the devil wants you to do. You get up and you repent and you ask God's forgiveness and he will forgive you. Yeah. And then you move on. You see? Mm -hmm. So truthfulness is important to our influence. It's important to who we are as Christians. It's important to our reflection of God in this dark world. You see? Now, the next piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. And you remember I said that the breastplate uh, was something that the Roman soldiers had on, and it, it, it covered from the neck to their waist, and it protected all of the vital organs, your heart, your lungs, you know, your intestines, your kidneys. It protected all of these vital organs. And what Paul is saying here is that what we need to protect our vital areas, which is our heart, and I told you in Jewish thinking, you know, that the heart represented a person's mind, and it represented his will, and that the bowels represented emotions, the seed of emotions and, and, and your feelings. And so to protect these things, Paul prescribes this breastplate of righteousness. And what is this breastplate? And before I even tell you what it is, let me tell you what it's not. It is not self-righteousness. There are too many people who are self-righteous. They look down their nose at other folk who don't have what they have or who who's may, you know, may not be living as well as they are or who may be involved in some sin that they're not involved in and they look down on other folks. That's self-righteousness. And they're entirely too much of that in the world. What it is not is imputed righteousness. And you remember I said that imputed righteousness is when God takes your sinfulness and charges it to Christ's account and take the Lord's righteousness and charges it to your account. That's what happens when we obey the gospel and we get into a covenant relationship with God. He charges our account not with the right, not with the sinfulness that we deserve, but with the righteousness that his son has, and that's why he died on the cross, to transfer our sins to him and his righteousness to us. That's not what Paul is talking about here. That's what God does. God does that, but he says here, you put on this. This righteousness is something that we must put on. Now, what is it that we put on? What is this righteousness that we put on? It is practical righteousness. 
And practical righteousness is the result of being in obedience to God's word by walking in the light as he is in the light. Turn to 1 John chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 5, beginning. 1 John chapter 1. Someone else get Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in, dark, in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ. His son purifies us from all sin. Okay, did everybody understand what she was saying? Everybody follow in the scripture? Thank you, sis. <clears throat> He says, verse 5, this then is the message, and this is the Apostle John, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is what? Light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, what? Huh? What did the book say? We lie. We lie and do not the truth. You know right? God is light. Light and darkness cannot exist in the same place at the same time. It's light in here. And as long as it's light in here, it's not dark in here. But if you turn off all of the lights, it would be dark in here. You know right? And dark and light don't mix. So if God is light and we want to be in fellowship with God, we have to do what? Walk in the light. But if we walk in darkness and say we are in fellowship with God, we lie. And the truth, and we just finished talking about truth, is not in us. Isn't that right? Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, and by walking in the light, that means walking in obedience to God's word, in obedience to his purpose for our lives. That's what that means. If we do that, we have fellowship with the Father. But not only do we have fellowship with the Father, but the blood of his Son does what? Cleanses us from all of our sin. See, it's like this. How many of you have ever driven in your car on a rainy day? What do you turn on when you're driving in the car on a rainy day? Your windshield wiper. Why? Because you want the windshield wiper too. Right? But as soon as you do that, what happens with the rain? And then the windshield wiper goes shoop, whoop. It goes shoop, wipe it away. And as soon as it does that, Right? This is what John is saying. We are like. We are flawed humanity. We live in a sinful world. We have an old man who is dying to get out. Isn't that right? And so when we walk in the light, striving to be like Christ, and we sin, the Bible says that the blood of his son cleanses us. But if we walk in darkness, that we are out of fellowship with God, don't have access to the blood, so our sins don't get washed away. You see? So it would behoove us to be righteous. Isn't that right? Now. Earlier you mentioned that two left shoes. Mm-hmm. Ain't it amazing God gave us a right feet and a left feet? Hmm. When I was a child growing up, I was taught always put your best foot forward, and I couldn't figure it out. But I did notice this. It can be in the dark of the night, mm -hmm. and you wake up, 
and stick your feet in your shoe. The minute you get that left shoe on that right foot, it's not going to feel right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way God created us as Christians. You can't get comfortable doing the wrong thing. That's a good point. I like that. But you know what? The devil is so powerful that he sometimes, if you are not careful, he can make you be comfortable with an uncomfortable situation. The Bible calls that having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You can be in sin and do the wrong thing for so long that you become desensitized to what's right. And you start to think that what's right or what's wrong is right. That's how powerful the devil is, you see? So we must always be sensitive to God's word and conscious of where we are and who we are in Christ. Isn't that right? Go ahead, bro. I have a calendar that, that I try to read every uh, day to the day or the whatever month it is. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions was, Saul and David both seeing now, why uh, David was taken back and Saul wasn't? Well, it says, you know, when you read the scripture and, and, it, and it says that David truly repented or David repented, whereas Saul never did repent. Mm -hmm. So Saul couldn't be forgiven now because was he not recognizing that he had done wrong? Was he too arrogant to, to, to confess his sins there? And he just stayed where he was, so he stayed out of fellowship with the Lord. That's the reason why David was able to David was able to go forward there because he repented and he got back in fellowship with the Lord. What David did, as is the case with Peter and Judas, what David did was every bit as bad as what Saul did. True. David took another man's wife, and had got it. her pregnant, killed her husband. Mm -hmm. He did all of these things, but the difference is David was brokenhearted over what he did. David repented of his sins, and he asked God to forgive him of his sins. What did Saul do? I don't read anywhere where no. Saul did anything like that. No, he didn't ever do I read where Saul, how did Saul die? Professor, how did Saul die? Greg? How did Saul die? Anybody? Did one of his kids kill him? Huh? Did one of his kids, the javelin? He fell on his sword, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. He killed himself. Same thing Judas did. And let me just say that, brothers and sisters, as long as there is breath in your body, you have opportunity to get it right with God. Doesn't matter how bad it is, what you've done. Case in point, my father was baptized in 1976 into, the, into Christ. He had a falling out with the brethren at the church, the congregation that he was with, you know, over some foolish stuff. I wasn't even a member of the church then. I was in the military uh, when all of this happened in the, in the mid-70s. And for 20 years, my father was bitter. You know, you couldn't talk about the Church of Christ to my father because to him, all of the preachers were pimps you know, pimping God and, 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 you know, taking the people's money and all of the people were stupid for following him and gullible. That was his mindset. In 1970, in 1993, my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer, liver cancer. And after almost 20 years of bitterness and resentment of the Lord and, you know, the Lord's church, in essence, the Lord, because if you hate his people, you hate him, he came to himself and he realized that the things that he was bitter about all those years, none of that stuff mattered. That was unimportant stuff. And on his dying bed, he asked me to relay a message to the family. I preached my father's eulogy on October 16, 1996. First eulogy I ever preached was my father's eulogy. And he asked me to convey a message to the family. And the message was this. Unimportant matters 
that divide family members, that cause family members to not speak with each other and fall out of one another, these things are not important. Materialism, you know, all of these material things that we kill ourselves to acquire, these things are not, are not important. What is important is our relationship with God. Amen. It took my father almost 20 years to come to that point. And when he got to that point, he realized that all of the stuff that was going on. Now, some people would say, you know, you've been away from the Lord's Church 20 years. There's no coming back. Well, who are you? This is the Lord's Church. He has the final say as to who comes and who goes and who stays and who gets kicked out. Isn't that right? But the point is this. He wasted 20 years of his life. But... Before he pillowed his head, his head in death, he got it right with God. And I'm saying to you that as long as you have breath in your bodies, you have time to get it right with God. But now what some people do is they play Russian roulette with their souls. And they bank on the fact that as long as I have breath in my body, it's going to be all right. So I'm going to do what I want to do. And then at the last minute, I'm going to say, Lord, forgive me. I wouldn't take that chance with my soul. I would not gamble that way with my soul. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. <clears throat> you are the salt of the earth, mm -hmm. but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Mm -hmm. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Mm -hmm. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on, on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Thank you. This passage teaches us that we as Christians have an influence in this world. Now, the question on the floor is, Paul says that we ought to have, or put on and keep on a breastplate of righteousness, which is a life lived in obedience to God's word. What impact does not having that kind of righteousness have on our lives? What kind of impact does that have on our relationship with God and our influence in the world? How does this kind of righteousness help or hinder us as Christians? Let's start with the obvious. How does it help us being righteous? How does that help us having on the breastplate of righteousness? How does that help us you know, as Christians, what benefit is that to us? It's, first of all, it, it glorifies God when we have the breastplate of righteousness. Number one. And it uh, allows our brothers and sisters to see that light mm -hmm. and to be an example. Mm -hmm. It expresses our confidence in God mm -hmm. that we trust him and we believe that he is who he says he is and he'll do what he says he will do. Mm -hmm. And we're not alone. Um, it gives us assurance. Mm -hmm. We know we've won the victory. And so the, the upside is that, is that we all of that. Speak to the mic, sir. Oh, the upside of that is that we're all of that because of him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it helps us to have a good, healthy esteem about ourselves because mm -hmm. we are the children of, of the most high God. Mm -hmm. You know, and now flip the it. script. Who, who, who cares to flip the script and tell me how does, you know, not having on the breastplate of righteousness hinder us as Christians? Uh, why if we don't have that light? How does that hinder us if we do not have, you know, put on the breastplate of righteousness? How does that hinder uh, us I, as Christians? Our well, walk? first of all, just me, myself, there. <clears throat> I don't have no peace in my life. There's okay. no peace there. I can't lay my head down there. My mind is racing. And then 
if I'm trying to tell some young person what not to do there, and he have seen me do <coughs> something now, he gonna first thing out of his mouth, but I just saw you do such and such a thing now that wasn't right there, and you gonna tell me not to do this here? <coughs> so I don't have no influence on him now. I or you'd be considered not. by that person a hypocrite. Yeah. You know, you're telling me what to do, and you're not, you're not doing it yourself. You're talking to talk, but not walking to walk. There it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's short version. OK. It, you can literally see the light is out. They're, like you said, no peace, no joy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, I, I'm not taking advantage of everything that's out there for me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm literally giving away my victory mm -hmm. when I don't put on the breastplate of righteousness, mm -hmm. when I don't. Uh, be that light and, mm -hmm. and be that salt. And I'm just, I'm giving it away. So it's denying God glory is hindering your walk and it's affecting your influence. So a lot of folk are being deprived because of what we do. Isn't that right? No, now, and you're being selfish. Now I'm going to cut it right here. I just want to uh, allude to the, the scripture that Sister Strange mentioned earlier. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Uh, I'm going to talk about that and then I'm going to quit. And next week we'll, we'll pick up the rest of these uh, pieces of our armor. Luke chapter 22. This is Peter. <clears throat> this is a lesson that we learn from Peter and what happens to Peter that can be applied to our lives, that can benefit our lives. Let's see, Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse number 31. Let me just share some lessons with you that will help us, that's beneficial to us by what happened to Peter. Jesus said unto Peter, <clears throat> Luke 22, verse 31, beginning. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. First of all, you see how the Lord refers to him? Simon, Simon. Mm -hmm. The name Simon means shifting sand. And that's what Peter was before he went through the sifting process. He was shifting sand. We read earlier where he said out of one corner of his mouth, Lord, I'll be with you, you know, even if it cost me my life, and out of the other corner, he's cursing somebody out, denying that he even knew the Lord. That's how shifty he was. He said, and the name Peter means solid rock. It means rock. So the Lord had to get Peter from shifting sand to solid rock. And the Peter that we read about in First and Second Peter, when he encourages Christians to suffer as a Christian and, you know, don't be, uh, you know, uh, all of these things that happen to you, don't be surprised it happened to you. That's not the same Peter that we read about in the gospel accounts. All right. Peter went through this process by the time he got to First and Second Peter. But here's what the law says. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Number one. The devil can do nothing to you unless the Lord allows it to happen to you. That's good news. He does not have final control over what happens in our lives. So everything that goes on in your life, good or bad, God is in control of it. And if Satan got at you, the Lord allowed him to get at you. You see? Yes. Oh, it's hard to accept. I mean, it's hard to wrap your mind around. Mm -hmm. Things that happen in people's lives um, that you know you you're like okay God did you really <laughs> allow that to happen or were you really in control you know hold that mic to you hold that mic to you I said well because I'm struggling with that yeah. you know and I I do struggle because you know when a when a rapist rapes a child or mm -hmm. rapes or mm -hmm. rapes somebody or something you know. Mm -hmm. God is in control. God is allowing that to happen. Now, would he, God, yeah, God allows everything in this world that happens. God allowed it to happen. He has the power to stop it or not allow it to happen. God has that power. But 
When God created man, he created man with free will. He gave every man the ability to choose between right and wrong. We are not robots. God gave us the free will. He gives us the opportunity to choose between right and wrong. Now, if you choose to do wrong, if that's your choice, God is going to allow you that choice. And that choice has consequences. For you, sometimes it has consequences for innocent people. But you remember I've told you in times past, it doesn't matter what happens in your life. That's really not what's important. What is important is your relationship with God. With your relationship, what's important in this life is not when you die or how you die, but how you lived your life. Did you live your life in preparation for eternity? Did you live your life as light for God? That's what matters. See, we look at these terrible things that happen, and we say, how can God allow all these bad things to happen? Why did God allow this 29-year-old woman to smother her two babies and then put their bodies in the car and put in a river? We, I can't answer that. All I can say is that God gave this woman free will, and she exercised her free will and did the wrong thing, and she will have to answer to God for that. You see? And that's what I said also earlier. The standard is the truth of God's word. It's not about emotion, because we get emotional about stuff like that. When we read about things like that that happen, we get all emotional. But our emotions are not the standard. Popular opinion, what you think about it, is not the standard. God's word is the standard. And God is going to judge what happens to all of these terrible things that happen. God is going to judge that. Our responsibility, walk in the light, be an example, glorify God, make a difference. In this world. The only reason this world is fit to live in. Because we are in it. That's the only reason this dark and sinful world. Is still standing. Because God is allowing. This world. An opportunity. He's long suffering. Is what Peter's saying. Not willing that any should perish. But even though he's long suffering. He's not forever suffering. There will come a time. When God is going to shut it all down. And all of the things that people have done, good or bad, they're going to have to stand before God and give an account for it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, just like every now and then we'll hear, we'll see where a parent and went talk to someone <clears throat> that has killed one of their children, and they go to them and they tell them, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just like you might say, well, how can she forgive him now? Well, she forgive him now and pray that, with the time that he might have, that he use it in a way that, that he can use, that his life be example to those that's falling behind him and say, don't do what I did there, because this is the results of where I'm going to. I'm going to the chair. I'm going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to be given the needle or the electricity or whatever there. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to tell you by letting you see my life there. Mm -hmm. See, forgiving him now, that's helped her to get over it. And that helps him. Mm -hmm. It still ain't too late. Like mm -hmm. we talked about Jeffrey Dahmer's mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. All the bad things that he might have done, but before he left his earth, mm -hmm. he accepted the Lord there. Mm -hmm. Ain't my place to say well, he, what he's going to do or where he's going to go. Absolutely. What he did in between. And understand this. Forgiveness is not for the other person. No. Forgiveness <laughs> is for you. Oh, Forgiveness, boy. you see, what, you know, in forgiveness, we are releasing the other person from an obligation to repay the debt that we say they owe to us. But the Bible says in order for us to obtain God's forgiveness, we have to forgive someone else. So if you refuse to forgive someone who does you wrong, God is not going to forgive you for what you do wrong to him every day. You see? So it's for us. It's to release us of a debt, a weight that we are carrying around. And it is to free up God to forgive us when we need it. Now, let me make this last point, sis, and, and I'll get to you if I have time. I need to finish this passage because I'm right in the middle of it. 
He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that it may sift you like wheat. I don't really have time to describe the sifting process to you. But it is a process that ultimately allows the devil to rock your world, to shake you all up and turn you every which way but loose. But Jesus said, but I have prayed for you. That makes all the difference in the world. No matter what it is you're going through, if Jesus is praying for you, it's going to be all right. Because his prayers always makes it to the ears of God. Sometimes things hinders our prayers from getting up there. Sometimes we are not right, you know, and we may pray, but God don't hear it. But Jesus' prayers are always heard by the Father. So Jesus said, the Satan is allowed to turn your world upside down, but don't sweat it because I have prayed for you. And he says, when thou art converted. And that word converted means when you've come through the sifting process, when you've gone, when your whole world has been rocked, and when you come out of the other end of it, he says, you're going to be better than you were when you went in there. But what you do is you strengthen the brethren. See, the purpose of your going through it was to strengthen you, to purify you, to make you better. And once you've come out, you help somebody else. How many times have we gone through things in our lives and then a situation arises where we have opportunity to share what we've been through with someone else and help them make it through what they're going through? That's what he's talking about. And keep in mind the context. All of this is about this spiritual battle that we're in. All of this is about the spiritual warfare that we are fighting. You see? So we must strap up and suit up if we want to be able to contend with the devil that we don't have the power to contend with apart from the power and might of God. You see? So it's important because if we don't have it on, we're vulnerable. And we open to his attacks. All right? I can't wait for next week. <laughs>